have been in Cabo. Okay, some of you, right? I've been to Puerto Vallarta, but not Cabo. But anyway, the offer is four nights, five days for two ninety nine, two hundred ninety nine. That's kind of cheap, right? Only like seventy five bucks or something like that. And then if you go through that, you will get two free nights anywhere uh, in the United States, uh, the mainland. You can use that two nights anywhere. And like, whoa, this is the time to go vacation, right? Uh, COVID is down, well, probably it's going up again, but at least it's not killing people as much as before. And Cabo sounds nice, and this is free. Um, so I'm tempted, right? But how many know that sometimes something that is too good to be true is probably too good to be true, and it's not true, right? So there's a catch, there's a fine print somewhere that says that, uh, yeah, you have to attend two hours presentation. That's normal, right? Two hours presentation. And then uh, you're gonna be given this certificate, which you can then later on call a certain number and then they will give you the ticket. At least that's the claim, right? But then I check online, that particular company, turns out that, that they make it very difficult for you to get the free ticket. They only give you the certificate during the presentation. And then not only that, you have to buy the airline ticket through them that usually cost twice as much as when you buy it yourself. So there's a catch, right? This free night seems to be true. How many have ever actually done this? You buy a $200, $300 for a nice vacation. Oh, you have. Did you actually benefit from it? You did. Okay, good for you. Good for you. I did. I did uh, buy a Hilton something something in the past for $300. I never use it for some reason because there's a lot of blackout dates and on the dates that I want to go. But yeah, I mean, you know, maybe some people, there's some, absolutely, I'm not saying that all of them are, uh, are false advertisement, but a lot of them are questionable. And um, I'm skeptical toward that kind of thing usually now uh, when, when I feel that when I hear an offer that is too good to be true, somebody tell me that's probably too good to be true. And, and we are living in that kind of time where and where you know a lot of people strangers and offer from the internet you know i mean they they want to take advantage of us right i mean a lot of ad advertisement want to take uh, advantage and harm us or steal from us so in that sense i think uh, our skepticism is normal right we should be guarding against that kind of thing and 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 people do people uh, are skeptic nowadays uh, our society is called the age of skepticism, the age of skepticism, where people are more skeptic about skeptic, uh, step, skeptical about many things. They are skeptical about government. They are skeptical about organized religion, churches. They are uh, uh, skeptical about big companies, right? They are, they are skeptics. And there are survey I read yesterday that show that people really uh, have this disbelief and doubts about most of the thing. And so I think in a way we need to have a healthy skepticism skepticism to protect ourselves against uh, things that can harm us. And, um, but thinking about it, for spiritual life, if the skepticism is directed toward the word of God and directed toward God himself, I think we, you know, especially God who loves us like a father, I think our skepticism is misdirected at best and in, is an uh, error. It's an error for sure. And unfortunately, this is where we often find ourselves having this kind of skepticism toward our good father. We bring what our skepticism toward all this people that is strangers, we bring it in our church life and spiritual life, and we direct our skepticism toward God and His Word. I think that is dangerous, and we doubt and we disbelieve even the good promise that God made to us in His Word. And the danger is it can cause us to be stagnant and unproductive in our uh, discipleship journey. And furthermore, it will prevent us to enjoy all the blessing 
that God has given to us, intended for us. So we're going to, maybe this is a good time to one more time ask ourselves if we have allowed this false and unhealthy skepticism to creep into our spiritual life. And every time we hear the word of God, instead of approaching it with the heart of faith, we approach it like we approach a scam email that try to scam us out of something. So let's pray before we look at the word of God today. Lord, I pray that the spirit of faith is here in this place because your Holy Spirit is in this place. God, guide us our hearts so that we may believe your word. We may believe that you are a good father for us. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to sit in this place and to enjoy the worship environment and to enjoy your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit works in our heart, transform our hearts and our, transform our life so we can become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Earlier during uh, the time of giving, we look at this verse that definitely says that God is a good God, Matthew 7, 11, right? Even you, even you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to his children? You, me and you, every one of us, we are evil, but even we know how to become a good father, amen? How many here are good fathers? Amen. How many wants to be a good father? But we are evil people, but as far as fatherhood is concerned, we try our best to be a good father. Amen. Is that true or not? Right? Now, God himself is a father. He called himself is a father. And if we evil people can be a good to our children, even more God, who is good God, he is a great father to us. Amen. So the word of God is telling us that God is a good father and as a good father he give good gifts good gifts to us amen how many can say amen to, to that God give a good God father give good gifts toward us so what is this good gifts what is this good gifts so Matthew uh, is one of the disciples of Jesus right and then he wrote this he remembered Jesus by the way this is Jesus saying Jesus teaching disciple I'm a good father God is a good father, and good father give good gifts, great gifts to the children. So, have you ever wondered, actually, what is the context of this saying? What is the good gifts? Some of you will think, oh, good gifts mean lots of money, uh, good car, good family, good wife, good husband. Those are all good gifts, right? But how many know, actually, this good gifts has a text? tells us what this good gift is specifically. And I'm surprised myself to find that turns out that Matthew, two phrases that he left out of this. But Luke, the writer of Acts, pick it up. The writer of Acts. The book of Acts is the books of the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, the formal name is the Acts of the Disciple, but actually it's the Act of the Di Holy Spirit through the disciple in the early church. And look, pick it up. So if you look at the same verse, the same saying in the book of Luke, you might be surprised like I do. What is the good gift exactly? So here it is. Same saying, but in the book of Luke, in the book of Luke, there's a two sentences, three, sen three, three words. This is what Luke recorded regarding the saying of Jesus. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, for Luke, the writer of Acts, he remember exactly the context. It's not just any gifts. Of course, God good, give good gifts, good blessing. But particularly, particularly in Luke's mind, the best gift there is, the one that, that you know, in general, God gives all the good gifts to everybody in, in heaven, but the best gift is reserved to those who ask. 
And this particular gift is called the Holy Spirit. So the context of this saying about the good gifts, look, remember. No, 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 wait. Matthew, I think you're missing two words out of what Jesus was saying. He said the good gift, but furthermore, the good gifts actually is the Holy Spirit. The best gift, more than any other gifts and other benefit that we can possibly get from God is the Holy Spirit, according to Luke. And Luke has the right to say that because he observed the life of the disciples after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. So in his mind, in Luke's mind, there is no doubt what is the best gift of all the good gifts. It is the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. So today, let me bring you to, to the perspective of Luke in what happened in the early church, how this good or greater or greatest gift actually work in the life of the early disciple so that we can learn something about it. By the way, the Holy Spirit then came on the day of Pentecost, just like Jesus promised, and it transformed a group of people. Last week, we talked about Peter. Peter said, look at me, look at me. Gold and silver I do not have. This is the healing of a lame person. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, be healed. That's Peter. Today we'll, we'll continue to see, to see the act of the Holy Spirit through the life of the disciple. And this is taken seven verses, two slides, rather long. But we're going to enjoy it together. Book of Acts chapter 6. The book of Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. In those days, those are the days of the early church. The number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jews, Hellenistic means the Greek, okay? The Greek, it's called Hellen, Hellenistic culture. So these are the, the Jews by birth, but they live in the Greek, uh, not in the Judea, not in Jerusalem. The Hellenistic Jew, but then they came to Jerusalem and then became believers. So they become part of the church. So there's a Jewish Jew and there's a Hellenistic Jew. So in this case, the Hellenistic Jew, the Greek Jew, that come from outside the area, among them, complain against the Hebraic Jews, the Hebrew Jew, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 disciples of Jesus originally gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. To wait on tables means to give food, distribute food for everybody. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Note that. Choose seven people that is full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal made by the disciples, the 12 disciples, pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and again, and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prokuros, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented this man to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them and the result of this decision and proposal that was implemented was that in verse 7, the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests, this is the Hebrew priests, who were in opposition, including the Pharisee and the Sadducees, the number of priests who were enemy became obedient to the faith. So, what we see, just to give you, uh, 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 if those are a lot of words, just give you a, a summary of what's going on. People came from all over the Greek kingdom to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. During the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Many, many people received Jesus as their Savior and Lord. 
So the church grew that day, but how many know that with more people comes more problem, right? So what we see here is the conflict, the, the Hellenistic Jews against Hebraic Jew. They feel that uh, the distribution of the food is not fair. The Hebrew, the, the inhabitant of the Jerusalem, it seems like they are getting more than the visitor, the newcomer to the church. And conflict is not good because conflict causes disunity, right? And so they want to solve the problem and the disciples get a, a, have a proposal. I believe that the proposal is from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. They choose seven Hellenistic men full of Holy Spirit to solve the problem. And then not only solve the problem, ease the tension, make peace among these two big groups. And we, we were not told how they do it. Even those seven people didn't say anything. We were just told by Luke. At the end, the problem seems to be solved. And as a result of this problem being solved, the church grew even more. At the beginning, it says the church is already big. But because the action of the seven people, the church grew even more because now there is unity and peace among these two groups. What can we learn? What can we learn about this particular incident in the church? We learn the people that were picked for leadership. We learn that people who were picked to solve problems, we will learn that people who, who are picked as a peacemaker are people full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in operation. The Holy Spirit is guiding the church for its ministry and life in the world. At that time, the world was, was um, not friendly, hostile toward the church. But somehow, even in the midst of hostility, the church grew because people were filled with the Holy Spirit and people has the wisdom and power to guide the church of God. So that's what we learn. And we can now think about our own time and our own environment in today's world. And immediately, I think you will not miss to notice that there is a big gap of what happened in today's church compared to the church in the first century. There is a big gap. The promise of the Holy Spirit says that people will be filled with power, filled with wisdom, able to solve problems, peacemaker. But today we see that the church you and I, when I say the church, I'm not talking about institution or an organization, but I'm talking about Christian people that gather together as now. We see that the church today are so ineffective, are so quiet, so shy to cause any movement in the positive sense in our culture. We are so intimidated. We are walking very weakly. We are a victim, so to speak, to what's happening out there. So different with what the first church in the first century is doing. Even in the church today, not only toward the outsider, even in the church today, somehow has lost the vision of unity and allow, allow disunity to, to just grow inside of us. It's not secret that many churches the people in the church involved in backbiting, lack of vision of unity, talk back, talk bad about the leaders that don't like, lack of empathy, and share, lack of sharing the burden toward one another. You know, even leaders are against leaders, involved in all kind of petty fighting instead of building unity and focusing on sharing the gospel for the world. We are busy, busy fighting, busy criticizing, busy not believing busy creating disunity even the churches everywhere in the world it would seem that the spirit of disunity cannot be solved instead of the spirit of unity the spirit of disunity is reigning even in the church today in the body of christ 
Why is it that we see that Christian today seems to be unable to become peacemaker and problem solver? We are troublemaker in a lot of time, creating disunity. Why are we not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit like in the early disciple? I think the problem lies more with us than with God. I think so. Maybe a lot of us actually has not received the Holy Spirit. Maybe we've been a, become a cultural Christian instead of Christian that is full of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we become religious. Maybe we forget that the plan of God when become Christian, the plan of God for the church is to become salt and light to this world. Maybe some of us at some time in the past, we were touched by the Holy Spirit, but we forget through the busyness of life, and through time, we forget that we actually have the power of the Holy Spirit is invested in us. We depend more and more on our own strength and or our own habit on how to become a religious person rather than become a Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit. If we want to address the gap of how Christian in the first century living full of the Holy Spirit, and today, weak Christ that is only religious, I think we have to change our mindset about the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm proposing to all of us, is that we look one, once again into our heart, into what we believe about the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. I think we really need, and the world needs us, to play our role as a person, as a disciple of God who knows their God, who knows the will of God, and we, the world needs us to show that we are the peacemaker, that we can function in that peacemaking task because we have the Holy Spirit. The world needs us to be a problem solvers. So many, many things wrong in our society today, but an even problem that is caused by Christian, the recent shooting in Texas, the shooter comes from a very religious family. But somehow it went wrong. So how do we prepare our mind to receive the Holy Spirit and His power? How do we walk according to the original plan, the way God wants His church to function in this world? I think there are three things that I'm proposing today. And number one, very, very quickly, is to realize that what we have today is not enough. It's not enough. Religious life is not enough. Our church attendance is not enough. Our tithing and offering is not enough. Our good morality that we think we have is not enough. It's not enough. We need something more than just a good, being a good person, being a religious person. We need more than that. What we have is not enough. We have to admit it. We have to be honest with ourselves. What we have is not enough. We need Holy Spirit. We need Holy Spirit. Along with the Holy Spirit comes the grace and power to live in this time and days. We need His power. We need the Holy Spirit. And we need to ask ourselves, is the, is the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, is that only promised to the first century disciples? Is, did God promise the Holy Spirit? Did Jesus promise the Holy Spirit only for His disciples in the first century and not for us? Think about that a bit. Do you think the world today is easier to live compared to the world back then? Oh, they need the Holy Spirit because they face opposition from the Roman and from the culture themselves at that time. You think that we are not facing that today? You think that we live in a better world today than back then? Let me just ask that question and you answer yourself, you will know the answers. And because of that, we don't need the Holy Spirit. 
and we can just live along being a religious person. Just be a religious person, attend church, give tithes, sing some song, hear some sermon, and we're good for the rest of the week. You think that is the case? You think what they had back then is sufficient? That is history. It happened. Okay, we know it. It happened and had nothing to do with us today. Did we assume that they need it but not us? Don't we want to have that kind of power and rigor that they had today in our lives? What was poured out back then to the disciples? The disciples and all the people in the early church, they dead now. We're here. We're living. Don't you think that we need it like they did? What happened to the church back then? The revival, the outpouring of power. All those people had that. You think that's enough for us today? I don't think so. I think we need the Holy Spirit. I think we need the gift of the Spirit. I need, we think we need the power of the Holy Spirit today. What good is their fullness back then for us today? We need to have our own fullness, full of the Holy Spirit, every one of us. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the word of God is this. That's why we have this scripture text. No one has ever seen or heard anything like this. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love him, but you have seen and heard it because God by his spirit has brought it out into the open before you. What it means is this. Without Holy Spirit, you and I cannot live in the supernatural way and a lot of truth, a lot of power is hidden from us. But with the Holy Spirit, he will brought out everything, all the blessing, all the promised power so that we can live today, so that we can see the thing that we never seen because we are so, so high hidden and, and living in our religious life. We never seen this. But if we have Holy Spirit, we will see things that we have not seen before. We'll hear things that we have not heard before. And the only way to have this Holy Spirit is to admit what we have today is not enough. We need the Holy Spirit so that we can live in a supernatural way. We need the Holy Spirit so that we can be a peacemaker, so that we can solve problems. We can be salt and light in our society today. What we have is not enough. We need to admit that. That's the first step. The second one that can that we need to do to change our mind is that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is truly wonderful gift for you and I. If it is not wonderful, Jesus will not promise it. If it is not wonderful, God will not give His Holy Spirit. Whatever God gives, it must be wonderful. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, recorded how Jesus promised the disciples to give the Holy Spirit. And then what he said is, you stay. Is it here? Yeah. Luke chapter 24 says, you stay in this place until the Holy Spirit is being poured out to you. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. A little background, the disciples hometown is not Jerusalem. When Jesus said this, this is during the last days of his life on earth in Jerusalem. He was crucified in Golgotha, a little bit outside of Jerusalem, but all the disciples come from a region called Galilea. So Jesus said, you stay in this place, don't go anywhere until the Holy Spirit is being poured out to you. It will determine your success or failure. You need to wait. You need to wait. That's what Jesus said. So you, you can understand how important it is, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that determined the course of the early church, success or failure. And then the Holy Spirit did came. The Holy Spirit did, was, it was poured out on the life of the disciple in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So when it came, when the Holy Spirit came, did the disciple says, Oh, 
This is all there is to it? Man, how disappointing. You think that what the disciples said? No. The Luke recorded that in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the disciples. Wonder. The word wonder then means in awe. They're in awe. Wow. This is better than promise. They did not know what's going to go on. They were just told, just wait, okay, just wait in Jerusalem until this thing happened. And when it happened, it blew their mind. They were in awe. This is truly a wonderful gift. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful gift. That's why they were filled in awe. When God, the good God, the good Father, gave something, it will blow your mind. When the good God gives you something, it will be more better than expected. The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is more than what they imagined or heard. They never heard before what kind of outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They never seen it before. But when it happened, they just be in awe. The Spirit truly is a wonderful gift. That's the second thing. The first thing is to admit that what we have is not enough. The second one is to know in your heart, in your heart, in your spirit, that the Holy Spirit is truly the best gift. And the third one, the third one, that this Holy Spirit is for you. It is not only for the first disciples that lived back in the first century. It is not only for pastors and leaders that seem so spiritual. It's not only for, for Christians that seem to not having fun and they're just there in their closet and pray. And so it's for those people. The Holy Spirit is truly for you. It comes as a package as you believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is also with you, but a lot of people are not filled with the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit is already part of the package as your, as your package of salvation. Just to show you the Word of God in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said, this is during the, the first sermon that Peter gave after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people were there because a lot of stranger uh, foreigners come to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate uh, the Pentecost. At that time, it's not called Pentecost, obviously. Or actually, it's called Pentecost, but not the way we celebrate it as a Christian. This is the Jews' holiday. And so a lot of people were there. Peter, Peter uh, preached, and a lot of people uh, believe in Jesus. And Peter was asked, what should we do then? And then this is part of the, the very evangelistic, meaning this is good gospel, the gospel that, that Peter preached for the non-believer. And he's saying it all in one package. I want you to notice the one package because all of you, I believe, you have received Jesus as your personal savior, but maybe there is more to it. This is the package. Repent and be baptized, right? Repent. When I'm a sinner, I repent first. I do not want to do sin, and I want to believe, uh, I want to leave all my bad thing behind. I want to start living as the children of God. And the next step is be baptized. So repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. We believe that Jesus forgive our sin. He has the power to wipe away all our sin. So that's why the first line is baptize and be bap uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. I believe all of us that, that profess to be Christian, we have done that. But then it does not end there. And you will receive, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice that it does not say you will receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father, they're all three in one. You receive one, you receive the other. But what Peter said is, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think this is where a lot of Christians miss this. Not only we receive God as our Savior and Lord, you will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then, who is this promise given? Is it only for the first disciples back then or for us today? The promise is for you, talking about the disciple at that time, 
not only for you, but the children that you will bear, your second generation, and not only that, and for all who are far off from Jerusalem, far off from Indonesia, far off from United States, San Francisco Bay Area. Those gifts are for those of you who, will be, who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Are you called? Are you called? Are you called to be children of God? So do you qualify to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that allow you to become a peacemaker, that allow you to become a problem solver instead of troublemaker and problem creator? The gift is for us. The gift of is the Holy Spirit's gift is for us. You have the Holy Spirit, but you are not filled with His power. So, what to do now? Well, I will propose several things for each one of us, including myself. Number one, examine our hearts. Examine our heart during our reflection time or quiet time, whatever you call it, or driving time when you have nothing that's bothering your mind. Think about it. Think about it and reflect. Reflect on the three things that I propose to you to think about. Do you think that you have enough? If you have enough, if you think you have enough today, you are living a good life today, and you know you are a Christian, and then your family is good, money is good. I guess nothing else you can add to that, maybe. Then, if you think that nothing else can be added to that, then I guess the Holy Spirit is not going to be able to to break through into your life. If you think that you have enough, I don't think I have enough. I desire to live in the fullness that the Holy Spirit can enable me to live. I want to be a contributor. I want to be a problem solver. I want to walk in the power of God. I want to become a peacemaker, even in the church, even in the society. I want to do that. This life is not enough to just become a good person with good income for me. Think about that. And in your spirit, do you think that this is a wonderful gift or not? Do you agree with the word of God or not? If you don't think this is a wonderful gift, I guess you will not want it. If you think that, I mean, I, I understand you want the benefits of the Holy Spirit. You want the benefit of the blessings. But a lot of times, we don't think the Holy Spirit is a good gift. And that's why we probably so far has ignored it or try to forget it. And that's probably why we walk as unimpactful Christian in this world. I ask that you and I, we examine our heart. And is this truth that the Holy Spirit is being poured out for you and I also today, instead of just some historical facts that you read in the Bible? Do you deserve the Holy Spirit? Yes, you do. Do you deserve to walk in the gift of the Holy Spirit to me? Yes, because the word of God is not me trying to say, oh, you know, yeah, we have it, we, we, we deserve it. The word of God says so. I ask that we examine our hearts today. So I want to end this very, very quickly. 1146. You can take a picture of these four verses in your time together with the Lord, read this. It's not that much, okay? I think we need to, my, ver, my words cannot convince you. It is the work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Take these four verses, read it again. Luke chapter 11, verse 34. All three, the first three you have read, I have read for you. The last one, I added it for you. James 1, 17. Find out what it is for yourself. There will be a quiz next week, just kidding. So four verses. Reflect upon it. We are celebrating Pentecost. Next week I will continue uh, the, the study of the Holy Spirit together so that we can truly understand the Word of God, so that the Holy Spirit can use the Word of God to transform our life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I know that sometimes being asked to examine your heart is not the best thing, you know, that makes you happy or 
you know, there's something that's going to trouble you. But I believe when the Holy Spirit speaks to your hearts, He will transform your troubled heartedness into some breakthrough that will bring you to the better place in your discipleship journey. We need the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand. Let's sing one song, A Good Father, and then we're going to pray.